There we go. So we're in Advent week number two, and um, so this week is peace, theme of peace. And uh, so it's that scripture that, that Calvin read, Isaiah chapter two, verses one to five. If you have your Bibles, you want to turn there. Um, and I've been excited for this Advent series. Um, this is uh, where I kind of, my, my church history, we did Advent, we do often the candles and the readings, but um, traditionally we didn't do a lot, the sermon series wasn't kind of the traditional passages along with those, so um, we do a Christmas sermon series, of course, but I was excited to get to kind of get into some of these traditional passages that have been preached on for hundreds of years, really, and, uh, and so just to really to be able to get into them and study them and and uh, I tell you, this week, um, there was so much in this that we're looking at today. It was, uh, we'll, we'll see as we get into it. It was awesome. Um, just an overall thought, though, as we go through the next few weeks, really what's been on my heart is what I shared kind of there during the prayer time. Just, just that idea that, that we live in this post-Christian culture, that we're going into a Christmas season, and we're about to, to um, celebrate a holiday that the majority of our of our society is ignorant of right it is in they they don't really understand the real meaning behind it and yet they're celebrating it and i mean our our culture goes all out don't they 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 i mean this is the biggest holiday of the year it's it's it it, our media our tv our um, music, everything kind of gets taken over by Christmas, right? It's the biggest shopping time of the year. It really, our society goes all into it, and yet, really, they don't, much of our, our world doesn't really know the, the meaning behind Christmas, the real truth of it. And so what an opportunity we have, right, to be able to share. And uh, that's just kind of what I wanted to um, kind of be a theme as we go through, and we'll see that in today's passage and in the next couple weeks kind of that to be our theme. And so Advent, Advent I think really shows us quite well. Advent is that it's the anticipation of Jesus coming, right? And, and, and where we are in history, we kind of get both. We get to, we're going to look back, we do it at Christmas because we look back to when Jesus came, right? When God initiated that, his plan of salvation that he had at the beginning of time, right? Before the world was made, it says First Peter 1.20. Before that, he already had this plan in place, and this was the time that he chose to initiate it, right? And start that off, and Jesus comes, and is born as a baby, and of course grows up and dies on the cross, pays for our sins, resurrected to bring us new life. And so we celebrate that, but we live in a time period where we're looking forward to his second coming. We, we too are in this, this anticipation of Jesus coming back, when, when it's going to be, that's kind of the final of it. That's when everything will be made new. And so we live in that in-between period, and there's a bit of tension there, right? There's a bit of tension there where even, even the, the Christmas story kind of shows this, where you have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, being born as a baby in a manger to a poor family in, in a nation that's oppressed by an evil empire. And so you have, and he comes and he, he, he once and for all conquers sin, and yet he lives his earthly life in a broken world and experiences the sinful world around him, you know, yet without sin. But he experiences all the brokenness that we've seen, that sin has done in our world. He, Jesus experienced all that, even unto death, even death on a cross, it says in Philippians, right? And so we live in that tension, right? We live in that tension of what Jesus has done, he's already done, he's already freed us, we can live as we're new creations, we're free in Christ, and yet we still live the rest of this life in a broken world, a broken world, and looking forward to that day when Jesus will make all things new, when, it, when there will be no more sin or pain, and that's kind of the tension that we live in, and so we can feel too this, this advent that the, the Jews felt before Jesus came in his first, first coming, and they were anticipating, they were longing, crying out for this Messiah to come. We can feel that same thing in our day, and so last week, Pastor Ernest, he, he looked at the first in the Advent about hope. And he, he kind of talked about these things. I thought it was so good. He, he gave us what the devil does. The devil looks to steal. Devil steals and Jesus reveals. Devil looks to steal. And, and in this world, we have the devil looks to steal truth, right? 
He, he steals the truth from a world that doesn't know. He tries to keep them blind, right? And, and then, but he also looks to steal truth from us. He doesn't want us to live the kind of Christian life that Jesus wants for us. So he looks to try and twist and, and distract. He, he steals with deception, with, with sin, immorality, right? And, and, and Ernest talked about that last week as well. And just how he looks to kind of steal the, that full life, that life and life abundant that, that God wants us to have. He looks to steal that away by tempting us with temporary pleasures and things. He, and for us as Christians, he looks to steal away our devotion, right? Our, our, our relationship, that amazing relationship that Jesus wants to have with us, he looks to steal that away by distracting us phones, whatever, you know, like the, the temporary pleasures of life. And so he's looking to steal, and yet Jesus has already revealed, Jesus has already brought us. When Jesus, when Jesus brought us the ability, we don't have to sin anymore. He, he's brought us everything we need for life and godliness, it says in First Peter, right? So that, Jesus has brought that, and that's a reality for us now, and so we kind of live in that tension as well. We live in this world where he's looking to try, and the devil's looking to steal that away, and Jesus has already brought these things, and that's what we live in until someday when we can be with Jesus fully. We don't have to struggle with all that anymore. And so that's the, that's the tension we're living in. And so as we go into here, into the, today's, we're going to be looking at that again. We're going to see that again in, the, in this prophecy of Isaiah. So Isaiah chapter 2, um, so ju- chapter 2, um, verses 1 to 5. So just to kind of get you where we are, our context here for the prophet Isaiah. So Isaiah was a prophet in Judah from 739 to 686 B.C. That's when we know he was doing his prophet ministry, because he says, from this king to that king. Um, and during this time, this is, to get your biblical history in there, um, this is the time after Solomon when Israel has already split. So the, the children of Israel, right, they've, there's now a northern kingdom, ten tribes to the north, and there's a southern kingdom, Judah, with, t- with two tribes. And Isaiah did most of his ministry in Judah. And so he's in Jerusalem a lot. And the temple's still there. The temple's in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So that's going to be important when we see here um, the first, look at our first verse of our passage. And then just so you know, in, in Isaiah's lifetime, he prophesied that when Israel would be conquered, and it happened during his lifetime, it was 722 BC. And he also prophesied when Jerusalem would be conquered by Babylon, which happened about 100 years later after he was already dead. But that prophecy as well came true in 597. So, and that's when the, it was with Babylon when the temple was destroyed. So we just need to kind of understand that um, context, because here, verse 1, it says, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. So we just want to understand this here today. We need to kind of see that, that, that Isaiah is living in Jerusalem, and he's gone to the temple umpteen times, okay? So there is a temple that has temple worship in it, and yet, as we look into this prophecy that he has, it's all about the temple in Jerusalem. And so what's it talking about? When is he talking about? That's what we're going to get into this morning. So let's get into it. So the first part of the, the prophecy here. Oh, just back on, actually, on the first verse there. Notice that it says, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. Saw. So it's just interesting. The Bible doesn't go into much more. There's not a lot of parallels to kind of give us of what that means. But I think we can safely say, he had some picture of it. I think the translation that Calvin read said a vision. Um, there's other places Isaiah said he had a vision. This time he said he saw, he saw the word. So what did he mean by that? We don't exactly know. But he got some kind of a picture of it. And I think that's going to help us as we go into this morning. We're going to kind of be able to picture this a little bit. And so here's what, this is the word that he could picture. It shall come to pass in the latter days... It's important, in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations, that's not Israel, all the nations of the rest of the world shall flow to it and many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. So here's the prophecy that Isaiah gets. He gets this picture, and he gets this picture of of the temple and Jerusalem being lifted up, and all the nations of the world are flowing uphill to it. You can just picture that, right? You can see all the nations are coming, and why? They're coming because they want to know 
God's ways, and they want to, to live in that. They want to walk in God's ways. That's what's coming them to it, drawing them to this place. And remember that for the Israelites at this point, the temple was where the presence of God was. And so it's this picture of all the nations of the world being drawn to God because they want to know his ways and they want to live in his ways. That's the picture he gets. And so we know this is figurative language because, he, you know, it's a picture of things flowing uphill and that. So this is figurative, right? So the idea is that there's, he's picturing this time when, when worshiping God is going to be, it's about influence and importance. It's about being exalted, right? So it's this picture of at some point, the, the worship of God is going to be lifted up. And people, it's going to be so much, so, so important, so influential that everybody's going to be drawn to it. That's what's going to draw people to. And, and so much so that they're going to want to learn and they're going to want to walk in God's ways. That's the picture he's getting. But remember where Isaiah is at. What's going on in reality, his current reality. Isaiah is living in, in Israel, which has been split you know, there's, it's not in, in any way this, this pulling together. There's still a temple there with worship. It's on a mount, the temple mount. But it's nothing like what this prophecy is saying. We have a divided Israel. They're at, literally at war with one another. They're, the children of Israel killing each other, right? You have, the, they're losing their oppression from the, the nations around, not coming to worship God. Instead, they're looking to, to snuff it out. You know, they're being attacked from every side. And then their own worship, their own hearts. Isaiah, much of his prophecy is telling them to turn back because their faith, their worship, had turned into, I mean, at best, some level of lukewarm religiosity, and at worst, just outright rebellion against God and idol worship. And that's what he's living in, and God gives them this picture of when it's going to be so much more, when it's, it's worship as it should be. That's the kind of the picture that he's, he's getting, this vision that he gets. And so when, when is that going to happen? <laughs> well, you can see there it starts with, and it shall come to pass in the latter days. In the latter days. And uh, that, that latter days, what's he talking about there? And so as you look, we're going to look, this prophecy is about us today. It's our time. So often Old Testament prophecies had, I'm going to say multiple fulfillments in, in a way. They, they had, you know, like, like later on Isaiah talks about those Christmas passages. King Cyrus, the Persians, actually fulfilled some of it. But then we know that Jesus was, the, the prophecy was about Jesus and he fulfilled it. And that's why we read those, those at Christmas time. And then sometimes they still have kind of a fully, they're going to be fully fulfilled at the end times when Jesus comes back. But this one here, as we look at this, I want us to see, as I was studying this, I was just blown away by how clearly it speaks to us today. That, that what he was prophesying here, what we're reading here, is, is about us today. And we see that here. So first off, it says in these latter days, that's when this is going to come. But this was uttered, this is from, the first example I have here is Peter at Pentecost. And so that's Acts 2. So after Jesus ascended to heaven and the disciples all gather in the upper room and the Holy Spirit comes on them, right? And then they go out and they start speaking in all these different languages and they go into Jerusalem and they're telling everybody about Jesus. And people are like, what's going on? It creates this big ruckus and they all come together and Peter gives the first sermon, right? This is how Peter starts a sermon. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And then he quotes, and in the last days. It shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And so Peter starts off by saying, okay, those last days that were prophesied back then, they're now. This is what was prophesied about. We're starting that right now. Basically, since Jesus' ascension, that's when it started, the last days. Or here's another example from Hebrews chapter 1. This is how the author of Hebrews introduces his book. He says, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. And so the same thing, the, pro, uh, the, the author of Hebrews is saying, we're in the last days. And then the whole book of Hebrews is kind of, it's a book readily written to the Jews to say, look at all that that was prophesied in the Old Testament. It's now, Jesus fulfilled it. That's what the whole book's kind of about. Again, the point is that the last days started at Jesus' 
ascension, Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Or a third example, and there's more that we could go to, but this one, this is my favorite Christmas verse. 1 Peter 1.20. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but he was, his, when they will, we will want, the whole the nations of the world will want to come and be in the presence and learn his ways and walk in his ways. It's right now. It's this time, these last days from his ascension until he comes back. And so for us, as I was thinking about those parallels, you think that's, the, that's what we live in, but do we see that around us? Do we see the, the nations wanting to come? Do we see people flooding to be in the presence of God, to learn his ways, to walk in his ways? And that's, so we live in the same tension. We live in the same tension where we have, we believe as Christians that we have the Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Right? We believe that we have that in our churches, that we have the Holy Spirit is here. Shouldn't we look different? Huh? So why is it that we, that we struggle, we so often our sin looks very much like what the world struggles with? Why is it that there's the conflict between us, even within the church, between denominations, between people within the church? Why is there that conflict, that division, just like Israel? It shouldn't be, you know? Why is it that the, the world seems to be influencing us more than we're influencing it? It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. And, it, and it's not, I know we're trying, I don't want us all, <laughs> it's not all doom and gloom, but I hope you can resonate with what this is calling us to. This is calling us that it should be different. Right? It should be different. We should be different. With, with the power of the Holy Spirit, we should look different. We should have the power to overcome those things. There shouldn't be the division. And so let's look again at these verses. We'll see um, how, do we, how does that play out. What can we do? It shall come to pass in the latter days, that the mountain of the house of the Lord, I just highlighted those, you can see again, the mountain of the Lord, the house of the God of Jacob, all talking about the temple. And so if this is, if this is talking about our day, if we can apply this to us today, can you think of any examples of the temple in the New Testament? Of where the temple is referred to something or talked about. Anything, any scriptural references or anything is said when the temple is talked about in the New Testament, what it's referred to? We are the temple, yeah. We the church, Christians, right? The, 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 the body of Christ, yes. Yes. Any other ones? That's one for sure. Can you think of any other examples that talk about a temple in the New Testament? Yes, the temple would be when Jesus said, and we'll start there, and then we'll get to the one Anthony mentioned about the church. But we'll start here. That's the, one of the first ones I thought of. Jesus answered, this is from John chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jews then said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And so a first example in the New Testament is that of this temple. Remember that the prophecy in Isaiah is that the temple would be lifted up, it would be made more important, more influential. Well, Jesus comes and he says, I'm, I'm replacing the temple. I'm taking the place of the temple now. And, and, and you know, go read the book of Hebrews. It, it goes over this over and over, kind of this picture. But Jesus fulfilled everything in the Old Testament. And so the temple was the place where people would go to offer a sacrifice for their sins. But Jesus is the final sacrifice, right? He fulfilled that. That's why there's no more need for sacrifices. It's where they went to be in the presence of God. But as Christians, Jesus is in us by the power of the Holy Spirit, Right? Jesus is in us, and so we have his presence with us. It's where they went to, to worship God. And yet, Jesus, you know, it, it's, it, he, we worship him, right? He's the mediator. We don't need a high priest anymore. He's replaced that. They would go there to be able to, they had to go through a priest. We don't need that anymore because Jesus is the mediator. And so Jesus has fulfilled everything the temple did. 
And so when, when Isaiah is talking about when is this time when we're going to when we're going to go up to the temple, it's going to Jesus. It's pointing to him, right? When, when there's going to be, people are going to be drawn to him. He's the temple. But it's not just that. Like Anthony said, on top of that, another example is then Jesus builds on this picture and he calls us, the body of Christ, Christians, that we're the temple. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? 1 Corinthians 3.16 or look at this one from Ephesians 2. This just paints such a picture of it. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And so do you kind of get the picture? That, that Jesus said, look it, I'm the temple. It's, I've fulfilled everything. It's all about me now. I've, I've, I am replacing the temple, right? And then he ascends back to heaven and he gives us, we represent him, we are the body of Christ. And so built on him, he's the cornerstone. We are the temple. We are the ones, we're to carry out Jesus' work here on earth. That's the call he's given us. And so this call to, to, for nations to come, to him, this call to teach, this call to share the gospel, all of that, Jesus gave that to us. We're the temple now. Follow me? Am I? I love this stuff. When I was studying this, I was like, no, well, this was just re- reference after reference. It was like, that's us. It's talking about us. And so my mind just kept on going. We could go on for hours, but I'll keep it short. But. But this one just is, again, this is what I was getting more and more excited as I was studying. So look at this. So back to our passage in Isaiah. And all the nations shall flow to it, right? And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. And so just like I was just saying there that Jesus has given us this mission to go out and to see this prophecy from Isaiah fulfilled, Remember what he told us to do, the Great Commission? Look at this. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all what? Nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Doing what? Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. You see that? This, this prophecy is us. We're supposed to fulfill this. We're the ones that are taken to the nations. We're the ones that are, he's going to be teaching the people through us. Use it, right? We have that truth. We look to share it. And, and I like here, it ends with until the end of the age, talking about that latter days. And so we, these last days go right up until Jesus comes back. So we're in the last days. The last days started at Jesus' resurrection, ascension. And then it goes right up until his second coming. That's the last days. And Jesus promises that this is the mission. This prophecy from Isaiah is as until he comes back. Because at that point, that's the climax. That's the final of it. There's no more nations coming at that point. It's too late. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And what do we see happen? Acts, the beginning of the church. So right after Paul's, or sorry, Peter's sermon there, what happens? But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, starting in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. We take it to the nations. Right? So we see this, we see this starting to play out in Acts chapter 1, and we're part of that. We're part of Acts going on, right? Um, and, uh, and we're looking to carry that out. And then, like I said, just wanted to reference the one other place for the temple is in Revelation, and we see it mentioned again. And I just thought this was just such a way to, to show how he brings it all together, the end of this prophecy, Revelation chapter 21. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, kind of same imagery that Isaiah is using, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And then it goes on, describes with the foundations and the gold and that. You can go read it. Um, but then verse 22, and I saw no temple in the city. Why? For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. There you go. No more need. That's when this is going to be 
the, the final of this prophecy being fulfilled is when Jesus comes back, his second coming. And at that point, that's when there will be, everybody will be, everybody there will be worshiping God. We will all be walking in his ways, right? That's the, that's the climax of it all. And so, with that in mind, as we go into the last, the end of this prophecy, he carries on there in verse 4, and this is really getting to the idea, this peace. This is where the, I, this passage is used about peace. But just keep that in mind. It's about today, and we're the ones that are fulfilling this. And he shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so he goes from this picture, Isaiah's picturing the, the Jerusalem being um, lifted up, the temple being lifted up, and every all the nations coming to worship God and be in the presence of God. And then he goes right into this picture of peace and unity, a time when there won't be any more any more war. You won't need soldiers or training or armies or weapons of war. And again, we go back to that same picture. The reality that Isaiah is living in isn't that, right? He's literally at war with the children of Israel to the north. That's, the, that's what's going on. And yet this picture is of a time when, when it, there will be peace um, and for us today, we live, we see the same thing. There's the war in Russia and Ukraine. We see the conflict in our own hearts, you know, this, and then the conflict between one another. And here we are at the Christmas time, though. And so, when's this peace? What is this? How's this peace going to come about? Well, it's back to the same idea. When the angels came to see the shepherds, what did they say? <laughs> peace on earth, right? That was the message, the first message about the birth of Christ. Peace on earth and goodwill to men. And then this passage that I'm sure we'll read sometime over Christmas time, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. So it's the exact same thing. Jesus, when he came, he's the Prince of Peace. He came to bring peace on earth. Right? And, and we are supposed to be the working to bring peace. He's working through us to see that happen. And so this prophecy about war and unity, right? We're supposed to be, that. that's the mission he's given to us, is to bring peace. And Jesus brought peace both in two ways, peace with God and peace with others. And so first off, of course, Jesus brought peace with God. And this is, I could have picked a number of different references, but this is the one from our Colossians series we just finished. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And so Jesus came and brought peace through his death on the cross, that sin that had separated us from God. Jesus brought peace, and so we can have a relationship with God. He reconciled that with his death on the cross. But then he also brought peace with others, or he should. This is the mission he's given to us. And again, I could have picked a number of different references, but I thought of these ones. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Matthew 5, 9. Right? We're to be peacemakers. From our Colossian series, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. That peace that we've, when, when we receive Christ, it should change us, we talked about in the Colossians series, right? It should have an effect on us. And so the peace that we've received from God, we should then, that should be evident in how we interact with one another. We should be peacemakers because of the peace we've received. And then from the, the Sunday school kids, when they shared um, that armor of God from Ephesians, for shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news, the gospel so that you'll be fully prepared. As we go out, we're supposed to put
put the shoes on. We're supposed to take peace with us. It's supposed to be what we're carrying. And we're supposed to take this peace out and be peacemakers and make an impact for peace in the world. Um, and so, here coming to the end here. Um, if you are here today and you don't know that peace, if you don't have that peace with God, if this is, if you've been searching, um, trying to find, trying the world's ways, trying to find peace and just life, life doesn't, <laughs> can't find that purpose or that meaning, you don't have that inner peace. Or if you've been trying, maybe you grew up in church and you're trying to earn it. And that's your experience, is trying to, I gotta be a certain way and act a certain way in order to earn peace with God. Jesus, is, Jesus brought that. Christmas was the start of him bringing peace and offering it to you. Faith in Christ, faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross, paying for your sin, you can have peace with God. And so if you don't know him that way today, I invite you to talk to somebody. You can come up here during the last song and um, there will be someone that will come pray with you. Um, But if you'd like to even just learn more, just if that resonated with you, this idea of peace with God in your heart, then uh, I encourage you to talk to somebody, to come up and we'll pray with you. And then for those of us that are Christians, the prophecy ends with this. O house of Jacob, come let us walk in the light of the Lord. Right? The house of Jacob is children of Israel. You know, Romans talks about how we've been grafted in. We are now children of God as well. We're children of Abraham. You know? And so we can, this is us. Come let us walk in the light of the Lord. Come let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let's walk in this. Let's, let's f- fulfill this prophecy you will, right? That we would be peacemakers, that we would look to share the gospel, that we would draw people to God, draw them to Jesus, point them to him, share his teaching. That's what he's called us to. Let's walk in the light. Let the light of Jesus shine through us. And so let's be doers of the word this week. So two things. Um, How can you share the good news of peace? this week. Can you share the good news of peace this week? And we kind of, we prayed that earlier, and so if there's something, I encourage you to write it down. I always say that, or share it with somebody. We know how we can be as humans. We know how we are. We like to, by the time we walk out the door, it's pretty easy to move on, and until next Sunday, and then hear something different. But we want, we want God to, don't you want it to be real? Your faith, like, I just want faith to be real. I want to see him working in my day-to-day, not just on Sunday for an hour, you know? Jesus, do a work through me in the people that I come in contact with. And then, in what situations or relationships do you need to bring peace? Maybe you're in a situation where you need to bring some peace. You need to be the peacemaker. You need to let the the peace of Christ rule in your heart in some situation. They're not always easy, but that's that's what Jesus calls us to, that we should be fulfilling this and looking to bring peace. Let's pray. (laughs) Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much. Um, Prince of Peace, we thank you that you brought peace with God, that you, you took the punishment that we deserve, and you gave us your righteousness, and we can have, we can look forward to that day when you come again. We can look forward to that day when we will be with you and there will be no more pain and there will be no more tears and there will be no more conflict or war. And so, Jesus, I pray that uh, you would help us. Holy Spirit, strengthen us. Give us opportunity this week. Give us boldness with gentleness. Give us the words to say. Give us eyes to see. And let the joy, the joy of our salvation flow out of us.